Hello and welcome to another episode of Autogefühl, today with me AJ and Jonas. On today's show, we're going to be taking a closer look at the 2020 Land Rover Discovery Sport. This version has had an extensive facelift with new underpinnings, a new design and a lot of new technology. So, let's put it to the test and see what it's capable of. 51 52 you want to catch me with the greed in your world 54 I'm keeping me captive put locks on the doors 61 62 Hey AJ what's up so I need your help actually, because I still got a BMW and a Tesla here to shoot and the Outlook Review community want to see another new car and I thought you maybe have some spare time, so just check out in front of your door. Surprise, surprise. Did your best to scare me off, try to put to rest my voice, try to make me think I don't have much of a choice. Wish me when I was down, play low tricks from behind. For new ways to take control of my mind I am alive I'm gonna feel the wood of the sound Feel the beat of the drums Feel the wind blowing on my face I let the streets put me around Put my ears to the ground Set some vibes straight up to the place The Discovery Sport is 2.17 meters wide and 4.59 meters long, so with this facelift it really hasn't changed in size much. But what has changed and what you will notice quite immediately is the front face. Before the Discovery Sport kind of had a more youthful look with larger and curved headlamps, but now I think this looks almost identical to its elder brother, the regular Discovery. So we have slim headlamps now with matrix LED and cascading turn indicator lights, vertical slats here with some aerodynamic channels, again very similar to its elder brother, a very sleek and slim uh, grille in the front with this gunmetal grey kind of a finish. I see a little bit of Freelander and of course I see a lot of Discovery in this, but it's kind of similar to the previous uh, pre-facelift Discovery Sport as well. Further down, a very large central grille here, behind uh, uh, which um, there is the radiator, the radar sensor over there, and a camera up here, parking sensors. There's plenty of cameras um, on the new Discovery Sport, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. But overall, this definitely looks like it's a little bit more mature. What do you guys think? You can also get the Discovery Sport in a more sporty variant, like the one you see here, the R-Dynamic. And for example, the bumper for the R-Dynamic is much more sporty, as you can see. Apart from the sporty front bumper, the R-Dynamic version also gets body-colored wheel arches, instead of having a black cladding. This visually brings the car lower to the ground and makes it seem a little bit more athletic, a little bit more sporty. Seems like it has a lower center of gravity. 
What do you guys prefer? I think I could go either way. Over here you have the Discovery logo, as well as the R Dynamic logo stamped lower down. You also get a black floating roof with black uh, outside rear view mirror caps. A very singular design line that starts off at the front near the Dynam uh, Discovery badge, which runs all the way through the door handles and joins at the rear lights. I really like this design line. It's very simple, so otherwise it's fairly straight and upright. Large glass area in the windows, so plenty of space on the inside, a lot of light, and we'll check that out once we're sitting inside. Also, of course, typical of the Discovery, we have a um, uh, C-pillar which goes back in this angle. Overall, I do like the stance. The wheels, by the way, start at 17 inches. You can get them all the way up to 20 inches optionally. We have 19 inches on our test car, and I think this is the right size. Gives, um, and it's a good balance between looking really nice, but at the same time having enough sidewall here on the, on the tire to have a, a more comfortable and cushy ride. Here at the back of the Discovery Sport, well, first of all, you notice that the roof line is still fairly high. And that means, you know, like most Land Rovers, it's a very utilitarian, very purposeful design. There is no coupe roof, nothing like that. It's boxy and it's purposeful. But you do have a glossy black uh, spoiler, which I think is purely for cosmetic purposes. But if you notice on the top of the shark fin antenna, there is a camera which feeds the view from the rear live into your inside rear view mirror, which actually doubles as a monitor. And we'll take a closer look at that once we're sitting inside. Discovery logo stamped in bold letters right across the center of the tailgate. There is a glossy black, you know, kind of design that's flanking the tail lamps. I'm not so sure how I feel about that. I could take it or leave it. And that's also connected by this other strip of glossy black plastic right across the middle. Sport, of course, because this is the Discovery Sport, D240 SE. So the D240 denotes the engine. It's very easy, the nomenclature for Land Rover engines. D is for diesel, 240 is for the horsepower. SE is the trim, and we'll talk about the trims at the end of the episode. And as we go further down, well, of course, reversing camera. And you do have like a diffuser, but again, I think it's just purely cosmetic. And speaking of something that's purely cosmetic, yep, cosmetic fake exhaust tips as well. The 2020 Discovery Sport is on Land Rover's premium transverse architecture platform. First of all, this has upgraded uh, suspension components like the McPherson struts in the front and uh, the multi-link suspension in the rear, but also this will allow for electrification further on down the road. But right now, we have a choice of turbocharged four-cylinder two-liter engines. First of all, nice to see gas-charged struts and some insulation on the top of the hood. So the Ingenium engines, like I mentioned, are all two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder engines, diesel and petrol. The nomenclature is very simple to understand. D stands for diesel, P stands for petrol, and the number that follows is the PS, or the metric horsepower. So you have a D150, a D180, and like the one you see here, a D240. There's also a P200, and a P250. The D150 is front wheel drive with a manual transmission. All of the others are all wheel drive with a nine speed automatic. Now, like its younger brother, the Evoque, and its foreign cousin, the Tata Harrier, the Discovery Sport is a front wheel drive biased transverse engine mounted layout. So that means the engine is mounted in this direction and is offset to this side. What that also means is that it has a front wheel drive bias. And then furthermore, there is no transfer case and low range to have uh, a four wheel drive system. Instead, this uses the GKN's um, coupling based on demand all wheel drive system, which means there is a coupling at the front axle with a propeller shaft that goes to the rear axle. And there's also a clutch based torque vectoring electronic locking differential for the rear axle. Now, this is a little bit different than the Borg Warner Haldex because this can decouple the entire spinning rotational um, mass uh, involved in the rear drive, and therefore there's less parasitic um, you know, influences from the rear axle. So it's supposed to be a little bit more efficient. Furthermore, this has the ZF 9-speed automatic. So while there is no transfer case, the first gear, the first speed rather, in the ZF 9-speed is a really low ratio. So it does give you plenty of low speed climbing uh, tractability. And finally, 
they also have mild hybrid technology. What that means is there is an electric motor and a battery pack, but that doesn't power the wheels directly. Instead, it helps power the serpentine belts on the engine. So this helps uh, maintain the ancillary systems while the car is coasting and it can shut the engine off. And when you need that sudden burst of acceleration, the electric power can be used to boost as well. key fob is fairly chunky, it's got a nice heft to it, and I also like the that the different buttons all have different heights and depths to them. So just by putting your finger over it, you know which button you're pressing. And the lock and unlock buttons, which are the most commonly used, have the most amount of contrast between the two of them. But in reality, you don't need the key at all, you can keep it in your pocket, approach the car, touch the door handle, and it will unlock for you. The door opens fairly wide, it's got a nice solid feel to it. After all, this SUV does weigh 1,800 kilograms. The top of the door is a nice padded material. Overall build quality seems to be much better now. The window controls are actually on the top here, which takes a couple, couple hours to get used to, but I understand it's okay because down here you have a lot more space to rest your elbow and it's also padded, so it's a very comfortable. Um, this is plastic and feels a little bit less solidly built, but not too bad. Memory functions for the seats. And even down here, actually, the materials are actually soft. So that's really nice to see that even materials lower down are very soft. Very cavernous door pockets for water bottles and much larger items. You do get the optional Meridian sound system, although having spent quite a lot of time listening to this system, it's not the best. I think the Volvo XC60's Bauer and Wilkins system sounds better. This audio system sounds good when you have, for example, Spotify playing from your Android Auto, but if you're Bluetoothing regular songs downloaded on your phone or listening to the radio with DAB, it doesn't have that good depth and uh, um, you know uh, clarity. Looking inside, I think what really grabs your attention is the kind of um, refreshed interiors now with the facelift version. It's got a very clean design, and as we look down here with the R Dynamic, you see the stamping for that down here. It also has a light, so a lot of little details like that, which I appreciate. The seats, by the way, start with fabric seats, which we always prefer here in Autogefühl, but you do have full leather options like the one here. Again, being the R Dynamic, you have red stitching and red piping to kind of accentuate that sporty character that is trying to bring out in this trim line. Automatic seats with a lot of adjustment, as you see, for lumbar support, for example, things like that with memory. So let's hop inside and take a closer look. Excuse my terribly dirty shoes. We're out in the woods to get some nice shots for you guys. I'll try not to keep the car, uh, or I'll try to keep the car as clean as possible. So getting inside is fairly easy. Again, because the SUV stance makes ingress quite uh, easy. Very large door opening uh, as well. Headroom is ample. I mean, it's incredible. It's really, really spacious. We also have the panoramic sunroof, so that also liberates a lot of space right on top of my head. I also do appreciate the lighter beige color for the roof liner, which brings about a lot more airiness and brightness into the cabin. The steering column can also be adjusted for reach and rake, although manually, so finding a comfortable seating position is fairly easy. The seat itself is fairly upright. You can take it quite high all the way, so if you're a short driver, um, you can really <laughs> take it really high up, but of course I always prefer to have it uh, fairly low down. But um, yes, you can have a nice upright seating position. So you have a really nice view out forward. You have that tall SUV stance that uh, people really seem to love nowadays. First of all, let's take a look at the material. So really nice soft material on the top. 
some interesting, you know, textured glossy element over here. A lot of plush materials over here as well. So overall, the build quality and the materials are, I think, uh, definitely a step up. What's also new and a step up is the steering wheel. I also like the kind of this shiny rim along the middle. Again, reminds me of a Volvo steering wheel. Um, it's fairly nice to hold, although, you know, the, the contours between where the strip ends and where the rest of the padded material starts kind of takes a little bit of getting used to. But overall, I think it looks really nice. Um, there's also a lot of controls on the steering wheel, um, which I'm not that fond of. So, for example, you have the controls here for the volume and the audio system as well as navigating through the menu. And technically, you can swipe down like this or up to change the volume, but it rarely ever works and you have to resort to using the buttons. And since they're very circular, you know, it's not a very clearly defined uh, kind of a punch where you have to push these different buttons. So it takes a little bit of getting used to. It's not bad. But what is a little bit strange as well is if we look at the stocks. So, of course, here on the uh, wiper stock, you would expect at the end here, you know, you turn on for intermittent or on and they stay where they are. But whereas on the other side for the headlamps, now it's it's off, but it comes back to the central position. You can turn it to auto, but it comes back to the central position. So you don't know what you've selected. Based on this, you have to always look on the console. So I think it's a little bit of over-engineering, overthinking, you know, but can't complain too much. The R Dynamic also comes with paddle shifters for the 9-speed ZF transmission. And yeah, on the right-hand side of the steering wheel, you have the controls for your uh, driver assistance systems. What's also really great is the head-up display, which has a bunch of uh, useful information, as well as this 12-inch fully digital instrument cluster, which has a wide array of customization options. So if we go into the menu here, it's everything can be configured. So your trip, for example, you have, you know, different trip A, trip B, and so on. You can also choose um, the content of each of these, uh, these uh, views. The display itself, you can choose the, the layout if you want two dials or one dial, which you know is pretty useful because you can have a map on one side, you can have your media or the trip on the other side, and just a tack and a speedo in the middle, you know, full media or full map, and plenty of different options like that. I always like to keep it with the two dials, um, as well as you have controls for the head-up display, vehicle settings, vehicle info, media, and driver assistance systems. So speaking of which, you have a bunch of collision avoidance systems like forward alert, blind spot monitoring, cross traffic alert, things like that. You also have steering assistance with intervention for lane keeping assist or just a vibration. You have speed limit awareness with, you know, adaptive cruise control. So plenty of technology to keep you safe on the road. Of course, another main talking point is this 10-inch infotainment system. In the top end, it comes fully loaded with things like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So a lot of hotkey buttons down here, which honestly, I wish they were on the top because when you're driving, it's a little bit hard to reach over this little lip here to touch these buttons. I would have much rather have these hotkeys or these shortcuts on the top so they're easier to point to or have this lip here smoothened out so that it's easier to tap them, you know, in this kind of a motion. But nevertheless, as you can see, Android Auto, there's a valet mode, um, you have a web browser, you have live traffic, you have different ambient light settings, um, and so on and so forth. Navigation is okay. Honestly, I would just stick to your Android Auto because it's not the quickest to respond, but it's definitely useful to have. Um, of course, this has DAB radio, you can connect your uh, phone and use Spotify. And there's a lot of cameras in this car. So, for example, if you go into the camera mode here, you have a top-down 360 view. You also have the, uh, the clear side ground view. So this uses the camera in the front and the sides. And as you start driving forward, it kind of uh, renders that image along the bottom so you see where you're driving over but it's really useful to make sure you don't curb your front wheels. Uh, parking sensors and, of course, being a Land Rover, you have 
see also it's a little bit slow to respond there is the off-road information there we go <laughs> so this view is really useful to see for example if you're in front-wheel drive or you have all-wheel drive if the um, the rear axle is locked you also can activate you know hill descent control low traction launch you have that kind of off-road cruise control button and similarly you can also kind of see your phone and uh, other driving or weather data on the side so pretty useful system you can also get these views on your instrument cluster as well as on the head-up display so for example you can see the tilt and lean angle and the pitch a compass and um, different uh, terrain modes that you have for the um, the terrain response system now this is your climate control system and i really like this design because it's very smooth very elegant and you still have the most important uh, physical buttons like for example to turn on and off your radio and your uh, you can also use this for a volume control so you have physical knobs and buttons for this you have of course your um, auto for the ac vent control but you can change the temperature with this knob over here if you want to change their seat uh, to be either heating or cooling you press it now you can toggle left for cooling or right for heating so very easy to use the system and if you want to change the blower speed you press this and now you have this becomes the blower speed so you're multitasking with these the same buttons here and i think that's a really good way of doing it similarly on this side you know there is no there is no terrain response selector anymore instead you press this mode and now this knob becomes your terrain response system so you have auto where it kind of picks whatever is the best um, uh, option automatically and best program but you can manually go to comfort eco dynamic and if we go towards this side you have the off-road mode for gravel grass and snow for mud ruts and for sand what I like about the center console is the fact that you do have padding along the side which runs quite a bit forward all the way and this is nice because when you're on a long drive you can rest your knee on this and it's nice and soft making it comfortable what I don't like so much is this really shiny cover around the gear shift lever because when it's a really sunny day and even if you have the panoramic roof uh, you know covered the sun coming from the windshield just reflects on this shiny surface and hits you in the face so hmm not a big fan of this color but you do have an inductive phone charger down here and a usb port over there the center armrest is nice and padded although i wish i could slide it forward because um, right now you can't move it but inside let's uh, give it the shake test first of all so yeah pretty solid you have some clips here to maybe keep a parking ticket or something like that a couple more usb ports and a 12 volt power socket and a micro sim slot this is your beverage holder where you have to remove this cover and then i don't know you take up space in your center console by putting it in here it doesn't really sit you know in length ways you have to put it this way and if you don't want this you can remove this all together and then i don't know keep this in your garage i guess and you have a nice central cubby but again here as well you know there's nice space you could even probably put a small handbag but when you cover it up it doesn't slide forward and this area still remains open so if this was able to slide forward i think it kind of serves the dual purpose of being able to cover up the beverage holders as well as cover up you know whatever you have inside if you do remove the beverage uh, the cup holders anyway the rear view mirror and the orvms are auto dimming but we also have the live feed with the camera on the back antenna displayed right here on this monitor you can also change the brightness for example as well as change the position the discovery sport actually has a very versatile seating arrangement you can actually get this with seven seats so you have five plus two in the rear albeit very small rear seats but nevertheless even the middle row can be moved forward can be reclined and therefore very easy to uh, have different combinations for your seating arrangements however getting into the third row i can tell you is quite tricky we don't have the seven seat version but you can imagine you know because of this wheel arch impeding um, into this uh, area here getting to the third row is quite difficult but nevertheless getting into the middle row is fairly easy you have a grab handle up here i'm going to try to get rid of as much mud from my shoes as possible and yeah inside there's plenty of space in here 
I'm 5 foot 8 or 1.7 meters, thereabouts. The seat is set to my driving position, and as you can see, I have ample knee room. I can slide my feet under the front seat. I have plenty of headroom, and because of this large, expansive panoramic roof, I feel like I'm not hemmed in. It's very bright with that bright headliner color, so really spacious and airy. There's also a there's also air vents here in the middle, as well as a USB, or rather a 12 volt power socket. And as you can see, you have isofix points for child seats on the outside two seats, as well as the front co-driver co seat. Although I don't like the fact that they just kind of pop out because you're going to lose these. But like I mentioned, the seat can be slid all the way forward if you want to have more cargo space or if you had that seven seat option to give more space to the people behind you if you're kind and you can also recline the seat back to relax keep it more upright so really versatile this is 60 40 so this one seat moves individually and this 60 part bench moves on its own as well as reclines on its own apart from that you do have a center armrest with some beverage holders, which are useful. And this little cubby area, which I don't know, it's, it's just about big enough to hold the phone perhaps. But other than that, you, you can also just flip this down as a ski hatch. Let's take a look in the trunk. There's a power tailgate and inside we have 963 liters of boot space. I can get rid of the parcel shelf and remove it all together. A very flat loading area, even not much of a loading lip. We have some scuff plates here so that you don't damage your bumper or your suitcase loading your items inside. There's some tether points over here which you can slide and lock into new places so that you can have, you know, um, different sections and compartments. First aid kit behind this little mesh wall. There is um, a 12 volt power socket over here and below this you also have for example your tire repair kit you can also optionally get a spare wheel and you can fold the seats down with the switches over here and they fold fairly flat although you're gonna have to go around the side and push them down completely so what does 963 liters give you well here is a standard cabin suitcase so as you can see there's plenty of space but if you don't know how big a cabin suitcase is for reference well here's a watermelon and you can probably fit I don't know 50 watermelons inside this I don't know maybe a hundred go ahead and try let me know let's start off our driving uh, here in the city because let's face it, even though this is a Land Rover, it's kind of gonna be used quite a lot more often in the city for the school run, going to pick up groceries and things like that. And uh, first impressions, well, it's actually not too bad. And that's because the Discovery Sport isn't as large as some of its older siblings, you know, like the full-size Discovery or the full-size Range Rover. So yes, it's a little bit wide and it's it's a little bit longer than perhaps the most ideal city car, but it's not that terrible. However, the throttle response, you know, when you're going at slow speeds, even in normal or eco mode, sometimes can get a bit lurchy. And when you're just trying to creep in and out of parking spaces or you're trying to parallel park uh, with millimeter precision, that's where that, um, that kind of jerky uh, throttle input can be a little bit of a problem. On the other hand though, the steering is fairly lightweight, so that's pretty good because you can make quick corrections and turn uh, you know, into parking spots and navigate narrow streets quite easily. There's a lot of cameras that you can use. You know, there's a top-down 360 camera, there's also the ground view camera, and I've been driving this car in some really narrow um, parking garages, and it is a bit daunting, but I've found the 360 degree camera to be a lot more useful than the ground view, because even though the ground view gives you a nice view of the front wheels, it doesn't really give you a good idea of what the back wheels are doing. So the 360 camera um, is good that way because you can see where the rear wheels are, the front wheels are, you can see the different tracks that these wheels are following and make sure you don't curb anything. 
That's also why I would probably recommend if you're going to be driving in the city and you live in the city and you want this car, it's probably better to get it with 19 inch wheels rather than 20 because there's less chance of you um, curbing them and scratching the wheels. But the ride is also really comfortable. You don't really hear any of the patter from the cobblestone on the streets. Again, 20 inch wheels perhaps is the better option for this as well. And the suspension is really supple. The adaptive dampers in the auto mode that I've left it in are pretty soft now. So it doesn't matter. You don't need to worry about body control. So they're soft, which means that you have a very supple ride. Um, visibility is also really good. Unlike its younger brother, the Evoque, the windows are fairly tall. You also have a tall windshield and the rear window is also pretty good. And if you have something obstructing your view out the rear, you can always switch on the rear view camera. So that's always uh, a good option. So overall, you have a good visibility. The outside rear view mirrors, um, you know, are not too bad. You can still see down in this direction pretty well. And again, if you don't, you're not able to see that you have camera assistant systems, parking assist systems, and so on. In the city, however, the engine doesn't give you that great mileage. Overall, and we'll see this uh, towards the end of the episode, we'll keep an eye on it. But in the time that I've been driving this car already, that's one thing that I've noticed. The engine doesn't feel as strong as its number suggests, 240 horsepower. Don't really feel that. And at the same time, with this mild hybrid system and the decoupling all-wheel drive system, you know, these efficient systems are there to help but in the end, they're not really making such a big difference. Or if they are, the end result is really not that impressive. You know, the mileage um, could have been better, I feel. Right now, it's really high, um, but we've just started off. We'll take a closer look at it once we're out on the highway to get a balanced number overall. Other than that, the rear view mirrors, the outside rear view mirrors also have auto dimming features. So on the Autobahn, um, at night, it's really nice because you don't get dazzled by the reflection of high beam lights from behind you. Even this, of course, is auto dimming. So it's very comfortable, light steering, quiet inside. So definitely pretty good at home. Not the most ideal city car, but definitely it doesn't feel out of place when you're driving around town. All right, now we're on the highway. So let's test the high speed mannerisms of the Discovery Sport. First of all, let's talk about the advanced driver assistant systems because of which there are so many now on this new uh, facelift version. There's things like blind spot monitoring, there is advanced adaptive cruise control, lane keeping assist, um, and things like that. And you can access all of that with a menu here right on your um, virtual instrument cluster and you have all of them at your fingertips and you can set up almost every parameter for all of these different um, assistant systems. So you have collision avoidance for forward alert, you have a blind spot monitoring, cross traffic alert, um, but even for things like the steering assistance, for lane keeping assist, you can either have it just buzz and vibrate the steering wheel to give you a notification that you're straying off the lane, or you can actually have it intervene and steer the car automatically. And this is one of those, you know, lane centering um, lane keep assist system. So it's not going to keep reacting to the edge and ping ponging you back and forth, but instead it will try to analyze the lines and try to keep you in the center. And it works really well. Even right now, for example, we're on the Contra Flow and I've tested this before. It does work quite well. Apart from that, you also have uh, speed limit um, awareness. So you have the traffic sign recognition and you can even set it to be alerting you right when you're on the speed limit or alerting you maybe 10 you know, kilometers per hour over the limit. So there's so many different uh, customization options for each of these advanced uh, driver assistance systems. So let's set the cruise control. Now I'm on the Autobahn, this is unrestricted. So let's put it up to 130. By the way, the increments for the speed I've checked is just two or 10. So you don't have one kilometer per hour increments to you know, increase or decrease the speed. So you could actually never get 135 or 125. It would be you know, 132 or 134 or 136. You get what I mean. 
it's not a big deal but just something to keep in mind I've also turned on the lane keeping assist and like for example you see as I go towards the edge of the lane the car will center me rather than just ping pong me back and forth I can set the distance I want it to maintain with the car in front there's another discovery sport the older version right in front of me so I can decide what gap I want it to maintain with the buttons here these buttons overall on the steering wheel are pretty easy to use but um, because they're circular and they don't have you know very clear cuts and different buttons for the different actions you want sometimes I end up pushing the wrong button for the wrong action it's just a little bit of getting used to it otherwise they work pretty well what doesn't work so well is for example the swipe function so if you want to change the volume down you should be able to swipe on this uh, touch sensitive button to turn the volume up and down but that doesn't really work all the time and I end up resorting to pushing the buttons themselves because I'm never sure if I'm getting the uh, the volume change that I want the mileage by the way right now since we're on the highway we've just been going for about 25 kilometers says 7.5 and this is what I mean 7.5 is not terrible but at the same time since I'm going at 130 I'm not even going 150 or 160 the speed uh, you know the, the mileage should have been a little bit better mm, like I pulled back into the lane now the advanced uh, sorry the adaptive cruise control noticed the car in front and braked for me so it's really safe that way but yeah the mileage could have been a little bit better in fact here in Germany if you do speed uh, above you know 130 in the unrestricted sections of the Autobahn if you go at 160 then the number shoots up quite rapidly I was driving earlier today for about uh, 300 kilometers and I was averaging when there was unrestricted Autobahn 150 to 160 and during that time I can tell you I can check I got about 8.4 8.5 liters for 100 kilometers um, so in the end mileage even on the highway is not the best what also kind of like I mentioned earlier you know is not that great is the fact that this engine even though it has 240 horsepower doesn't feel like a lot so let's cancel this and let's let's pick up speed and we'll try to test that I put my foot down it takes a little bit of time for it to react and I'm not getting such an instant shove it's not terrible but it's I would expect a little bit more sharpness um, for 240 horsepower of course I'm in the automatic mode even if I do go to the dynamic mode and set the gearbox in sport beyond 130 kilometers per hour there isn't so much acceleration that you can expect from this but coming into sport mode you know the dials do change the head-up display which is really useful by the way also has a little bit of a different uh, design for the um, speedometer and the RPM uh, the tachometer so it has a nice um, nice graphics but the engine doesn't sound nice so it's not a very sporty car and I'm saying that because this is the R dynamic version so if anything this should have been the more sporty variant so it really isn't if you want something sporty it's better you stick with the X3 or the Macan in the premium segment at least um, but yeah in terms of comfort let's go back into auto and uh, let's go into again the automatic driving mode as well um, it is fairly quiet at 130 there is very little noise intruding into the cabin you can hear a little bit of tire noise at this speed but there is a lot of sound insulation and I think these 19 inch wheels are doing a good job anything if you had the 20 inch wheels you could expect a little bit more road noise and tire noise so this is I would recommend you stick with the 19 inches at this speed wind is not a problem but if you do go over 150 and you then you will definitely hear the speed um, sorry the wind a lot more then but the seats are also fairly comfortable you have plenty of adjustments they're very supportive um, heated and ventilated so you're on a hot summer day if you just jump into the car you can turn on the ventilators and it will cool the seat and you know cool your back so you don't get sweaty on the seat um, steering is actually quite heavy so at higher speeds it is nice but it does feel on the heavier side um, but at the same time there is still always a bit of vagueness in the steering it's not a deal breaker at all but 
it doesn't have that sharp responsiveness. It's kind of like throwing punches underwater. I don't know if you were a kid. I used to do this when I was a child. I used to go to the pool, go underwater and pretend I was a ninja and kick and punch. And it was all kind of in slow motion and floating. And this reminds me of that. Everything has a little bit of vagueness and delay and disconnection with the, with the, you know, with, with the whole sensation and the feedback of the steering. Um, and the throttle as well, actually. But on the whole, mile munching is definitely another forte of the Discovery Sport. Definitely comfortable, very uh, sure-footed, even at high speeds. It's very planted, nothing really upsets it. Crosswinds don't buffet the car. Undulations on the road surfaces don't toss it up and down. It's very composed and you have that peace of mind of the torque vectoring and the all-wheel drive system which guarantees great traction in dry and wet conditions. All right, so now we're in a very narrow single lane mountain road. So let's put it through its paces, bumpy streets as well. So here you can feel that slightly stiffer suspension, but overall it's still very comfortable. Body control is fairly impressive really for an SUV of this size. The good visibility is definitely aiding, but the A-pillar, you know, again, it's not a sports car, but uh, if you're going around a corner at a really high speed, it's hard to look into the corner because the A-pillar kind of impedes that view, but um, otherwise it's not too bad. The steering rack is also fairly slow in the sense that, you know, you need to give a lot of lock to get a turn. It's not that progressive. It's not a fast track. This is again good for a city and it's good for off-roading at least. Yeah, that rotation really comes into play now. See, we're going around these hairpins. Slow down, turn into the corner, put the foot down. Ah, under understeer and wheel spin, but not that bad. You know, I wouldn't have mind. I wouldn't mind if they had some kind of a artificial sound being pumped in. You know, that would be okay with me actually. This is a nice winding hairpin section, and that engine, the power delivery is still not linear, even in this mode. Let's just leave it in automatic sport. So I'm going to let it pick the gear that it wants, because there is not a lot of torque low down in the rev range, and. The power delivery is quite abrupt and sporadic, you know. The engine does get a bit grumbly at higher RPMs, although you don't really feel that vibration too much on the steering wheel. But yeah, I'm not really feeling too much of what the wheels are doing. Hmm. But it's still very comfortable, it's very composed, very confidence inspiring, a lot of lateral grip. A lot of longitudinal grip. Let's take the best, sorry, let's test the brake. Yeah. Be brake pedal feel is again a bit hit and miss at times. But yeah, this is not a surprise. I'm sure you're not surprised. It's a Land Rover. It's not a Porsche Macan. Um, it's definitely better at off-roading. Unfortunately, I don't have an off-road park to play around with. And like we spoke about earlier, this doesn't have a, a transfer case with lower range. It's uh, effectively a front wheel biased transverse engine layout platform. So there is a GKN coupling based all wheel drive system um, called an active drive line. I think that's what Land Rover calls it. So it's front wheel drive until it needs all wheel drive and then the coupling engages and sends torque to the rear. The rear axle is a torque vectoring locking electronic differential so that can play around with the torque and do all sorts of magic with it. So it's not, a, it's not a very sporty car and it's not, uh, it's not a true off-roader like the Discovery or the Defender. But the ZF transmission, like I mentioned, the first gear is quite, quite low ratio. So you do get, you know, like a quasi semi granny gear, kind of. So if you really want to go up some mudded ruts or use it to control your hill descent, first gear on this ZF uh, will definitely help. 
but body control is really nice just stitching those those flowing bends back and forth it really does give you confidence you forget that it's a 1800 kilogram SUV well I think overall um, I'm fairly satisfied with this car it met my expectations uh, of what I had in terms of it being very comfortable I really like the technology that it has to offer now the assistance systems are really confident and confidence inspiring they're very good they work well but the mileage could have been better it's not that sporty to drive well we found a little gravel track so let's see what the train response system has to offer of course in reality this is not a challenge for most cars let alone the discovery sport but there's some interesting views that i can have for example on the infotainment system there's a view here which shows me if i have two-wheel drive or all-wheel drive which wheels are getting the traction the steering angle i can also see another view for the pitch and the tilt of the car a compass i even have those views up here on my head-up display but first i'm going to go into the terrain response system and select gravel, snow and um, activate low traction launch. No, I don't think I need low traction launch, but if this track was covered in snow and ice, then sure, I think that would have been a great um, uh, you know, program to select because it will modulate the throttle. Again, like I mentioned, it'll keep this very low ratio first gear, manage the throttle very uh, gently and gradually to uh, help me set off it's not that uncomfortable either I have good visibility I can see through the corner from this uh, from my side window I can peer in between the gap from the outside rear view mirror I can also see where I'm placing the wheels here I can make sure I don't hit any of the rocks There's a lot of trees around here if in case I do find this a bit tricky there's of course the ground view and what this allows me to do is when I'm driving, it will record the track in front of me and display that so I can see virtually through the hood. I can see where the front wheels are placed. I can see where the, um, you know, what's going underneath me. So if I'm going over a big rock, I can make sure that I'm not going to scrape it. I still would recommend you keep the 19 inch wheels because even on a rough road like this, it's still absorbing the uh, you know the, the the gravel and the shocks much better than a 20 inch rim would do and there's also less chance of you scraping it so this is definitely where this feels a little bit more at home and you know all said and done this is not the defender it's not a true hardcore off-roader but it's still charming it still gives me that spirit of adventure you know a weekend hobbyist i'm not a true off-roader at all but this allows me to feel that sense of adventure and go any variability and make me feel that I can do something extremely crazy or you know go to some new unforeseen places we're going up a very steep hill so let's see how it behaves here very gradual let's see let's go into the off-road view um, there it is off-road information this also has a pretty good weighting depth capacity so I'm, I've pretty much come to a complete stop on the top of this uh, incline, or in this incline, and I can see that the front wheels are now only activated, but I can easily get up this hill with no problem. Let's see, let's put this camera view here so I can see what's happening in front. Now there's a pretty steep descent and a quick ascent as well. So let's see if we can manage this. I can use this view to ensure that I'm not going into any crazy situations. A very steep climb. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> I am pretty, pretty steep. I don't know, I can't see the angle of uh, incline. So definitely not a problem at all for this. And yeah, more rocky surfaces. But as you can see, if you're going to be doing this kind of off-roading, not a problem at all. So it does fulfill 
whatever small, however, adventure uh, requirements that you might have, and it does them pretty well. The Discovery Sport starts with the base trim, then the S, then the SE, and then finally the HSE. The base trim starts at around 38,000 euros, the SE starts at around 56,000 euros, but our uh, test vehicle here with all the bells and whistles that it has is a whopping 63,000 euros, which is a bit expensive if you ask me. So what are you getting for that money? Well, first of all, it's the Land Rover Spirit of Adventure, the go anywhere ability that this brand stands for. And sure, this might not be the most off-road capable Land Rover out there, but it's certainly much more capable than some of its rivals. It's also very comfortable, very spacious on the inside, very luxurious. I really like a lot of the new technology that is on offer. The virtual instruments work really well. The infotainment, not so well, but I do like the camera systems. And of course, that terrain response, all-wheel drive, on-demand system provides the best of both worlds for 90% of the population. What I didn't like so much, perhaps, is the fact that it doesn't really give you very good mileage. The diesel engines should be a little bit more efficient, so I would recommend stick to the 180 and skip this top-end diesel uh, engine. Secondly, it's not the most dynamic SUV out there. And again, I don't think it's really trying to be. If you want something sporty and still have an SUV, then you should better, uh, you'll be better off picking the BMW X3 or the Porsche Macan. If you don't want a luxurious premium uh, 5 plus 2 um, midsize SUV, then you have plenty of options like the 5008 or the Kodiak. So overall, keep the options minimal, spec it just right, and if you want to go on that adventure, take it off-roading, the Discovery Sport might just be the car for you.